Well, once again, friends, my name is John. I'm the pastor here, and I am just so excited to get to worship with each and every one of you as we continue a series that we started a couple weeks back entitled New Year, New You. If you remember, this was a series built around a number of common New Year's resolutions that people make and then very promptly within a week or two break. Uh, but we're still going to look at them. We're going to look at some practical tips of how to accomplish these resolutions but we're also going to be talking about some more philosophical or foundational ideas that really help us to actually stick to this stuff. And so the first week, we talked about our physical health. And we said that while it's really important to understand how to get more healthy physically, why you're doing it, and what you need to do to do that, those things are actually a little more important, the why and the what, than the how. And so we said focus on the why behind the how. Well, today we're going to be talking about your money because it turns out a lot of people make resolutions around their spending, around their earning. And so this week, we're going to be talking about that, but let me spoil it a little bit for you. We're going to suggest that if you have more money, you've got more problems. More money, more problems. Uh, But before we get into that, I want to ask you a really serious question. This is really important. In-person people, you're going to share with somebody around you. This is your chance to brag. It's going to be cool. Online people, you're going to have to share down below. That's your chance to brag in front of way more people. Uh, or I mean way less people, because there's like 800 people here in person today. Uh, Online people, there's only like six of you, so. Um, Either way, the question is, how much money have you had in your hand? What is the largest amount of cash that you've ever held? Now, this does not count your bank account. I'm not talking about your bank account. We're not talking about some kind of check that you had that had a big number on it. We're not talking about your friend who had a big stack of cash in their hand. We're talking about the largest amount of cash you've ever had in your hand. Take a minute, go ahead and share with each other that amount right now. Okay, that's long enough. We've got a lot of confused faces, a lot of folks who are like, some of them are like, it was this big. We're not talking about the fish you caught. We're talking about the largest amount of cash that you've held in your hand. Now, when I was thinking about this, I really wanted to impress everyone. I wanted to brag. So initially, I thought about when my father, when I was a small child, my dad bought a pickup truck, relatively new, for cash. It was $28,000 in cash that he had in his hands, but I had none of it in my hands, so that doesn't count. And then I thought about this car that I bought when I was younger. When I was a younger man, my wife and I saved up enough money to purchase a car all up front. It was $13,000, but it was a check. Then I thought, well, I guess every month I go to the bank and I say, I need $1,500 for my monthly like, money for groceries and for me to buy gas station snacks and to put gas in my car. And so that's probably the largest amount, but then it came to me. And I realized that there's actually one time where I held more money in my hands. It was an incredible amount of money. It was all of $5. Now, here's the thing. This is all relative, right? So I was like six years old. I got to spend the day with my dad at the sporting goods store that he owned in Owego, New York. And because I got into everything, like ripped open packaging, played with stuff, lost things, hid things under shelves, my father gave me a job. And he said, John, if you do this job, I will pay you one $5 bill at the end of the day. The job was that I had to get inside of his glass display case and clean it, all of it. And so he took all the guns and all the knives out of the display case, don't worry. And then he gave me a roll of paper towels and a bottle of some kind of mystery chemical. And he slid open the back of the display case and he said, get in there and get cleaning. And I swear to you, I spent the rest of the day cleaning every little nook and cranny. I would think I was done, and then he would say, no, there's a little bit over here. Oh, there's a little bit up there. And so I basically got gassed with whatever chemical I was using all day. I I swear to you, my parents are good parents. But, But I may have lost several brain cells in that operation. But at the end of it, he handed me this crisp new $5 bill, and I felt like the richest human being in the entire world. I mean, I had worked really hard for that. I remember driving home from my dad's store through the streets of Owego with my $5 bill up against the window so everyone else could see that I had $5 all to myself. Now, some of you think this is funny, but this is what we're talking about today, this idea that sometimes the money that we work really, really hard for is more valuable to us. The money that we really earn really matters. Uh, But regardless of what we're talking about, remember today, more money, 
more problems. This is going to come out loud and clear in our scripture passage. So this is coming from Ecclesiastes. I'm going to be reading Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Uh, just to give you some background, Ecclesiastes is part of what's called wisdom literature. It's scripture in your Bible that is supposed to have wise sayings. It's supposed to be valuable and meaningful, and it's supposed to last a lifetime, right? This wisdom literature is purported, at least by tradition, to be written by Solomon, who was said to be the wisest man ever. This book, Ecclesiastes, it also has the lyrics to the song, Turn, 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 by the birds, almost verbatim. I'm pretty sure they just ripped it off, and I don't think that they said, oh, we stole this from the Bible. Uh, That happens a lot. You may not realize that, but musicians, they take stuff from the Bible all the time. Uh, But the passage we're going to read today is talking about money. So let's get into that again. It's Ecclesiastes 5, verses 10 to 11. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? This is God's word. It's given for each and every one of you. And I want to take you back to verse 10. In verse 10, we're told, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And that all of this is meaningless. I want to focus in on that word love, because just like in the, the Greek language, this language that this was written in Hebrew has a bunch of different words for love. And they mean different things, but the word the author chose here to use for love is often, and by often I mean like almost always, used to describe a relationship between two people, right? Two people who love each other, whether they're friends or spouses or close relatives, the love that people have for one another. And yet here he talks about it in the love that some people have for their money. And what's going on here is he's suggesting that you are loving money the way you should love a person. Or dare I say, you're loving money more than a person. All of this is bad news. And this is not just in this Ecclesiastes, this wisdom literature. We hear this echoed in the New Testament, right? In 1 Timothy, this might be one you've heard. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, "...for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil." Often that one gets misquoted as, money is the root of all evil. It's not money that's the problem. It's the way we love the money, right? It's our attitude toward the money. The point here, though, is that to love money, not a good thing. And he ultimately sums up in verse 10 by saying that this is meaningless. Literally, that word means emptiness. And what's going on is that if you love money, if you strive after money, if you only want money or stuff, you're putting money in a place where it doesn't belong. You're elevating it from being a means to an end, right? A way to get something to an end in and of itself. You're making it your goal. And the author is saying, guys, this is going to lead to nothing. It's going to lead to emptiness and meaninglessness. He doesn't stop here. He moves on into verse 11. And in verse 11, he says, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? So what he's saying is the more money you have, the more problems you have. The more money you have, the more people want to come and take your money. Now, if anyone's ever run into a large sum of money, you want to keep that a secret. Because as soon as other people find out, they want to borrow some money from you. They want just a little help, right? They want to become your friend or remind you of how good of friends you are so that then they can get some of that. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, this doesn't just stop with people getting more money uh, or people wanting more of your money. He talks about this, uh, and this word consume is often used to talk about food, right? It's like eating food. And so the, the vision that he's giving us is this idea that when you get more money, more people come around and they eat up your money. Now, I don't think he means literally eat up, but it does make me hungry. Anybody else hungry? A little bit hungry? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit hungry. And so it makes me think about, man, I want to I eat something. And this is online only, in-person people. You just got to stay here quietly. You cannot discuss this. But online only people, as so we're talking about that word consume and food, I want to know what food can you just not get enough of? Like you can eat it and eat it and eat it and you still want more of it. And for me, at first I thought steak. Like I love steak. But then I thought, but I really like hamburgers too. And then I remembered that a couple months ago, a number of people in this church got me a bunch of Twizzlers. And it was embarrassing how many Twizzlers people kept giving me because somebody had said, oh, John likes Twizzlers. So I just package after package after package. And somebody came to me at the end. I had like 10 packages of Twizzlers. 
And they said, oh, maybe we overdid it. I'm really sorry. And I said to him, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I will eat all of these Twizzlers. And that's, I'm ashamed about that. And I did. Like, I think I got them all in October at the end of the month, and I think I ate them all, like, by the beginning of December. I might have a sugar problem. I don't know. That's sad, right? But online, whatever food you can't get enough of, go ahead and comment that down below. Uh, but really what the author here is talking about is this idea of not being able to get enough money. And the people that surround us when we get money, they want more of our money. Ultimately, again, what we want to focus on is this idea that if we control our money or we want to control our money, otherwise it will control us, right? Control your money or it will control you. We're going to talk more about that, but I want to take you back to the idea of more money, more problems. I want to quickly recap where we're at. So far, we're talking about this idea that the more money you have, the more there are people around you wanting to take your money. The other thing that happens when you get money is then you have more stuff to worry about, right? Now, think about this. You may not have a lot of money, but whenever you've got a new phone, a new car, a new home, new clothes, anything new, you're immediately like, I don't want that new thing to get ruined, right? You park the new car far away from all other cars. You start to look at other human beings as like, they're going to harm my new car. Your new phone, you put it in like 37 cases so it's nice and safe. And then when people call, you can't hear them anymore. But you're like, but my new phone is safe. Your new outfit, you're like, I can't eat with this. So then all of a sudden you're like putting a bib on in a restaurant and you look a little silly, but you're like, but it's a new blouse. I can't get a stain on it. More money, more problems. And yet the author of Proverbs is another wisdom literature purported to be written by the same person, that same Solomon. Proverbs 13, 11 gives us, I think, a solution to this problem. In Proverbs 13, 11, he says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. The author of Proverbs is suggesting that the solution to our problem is not to get a lot of money quick, but to gather it little by little. And that's something I want you to remember, this idea of little by little. I know a lot of you laughed when I said $5, most money I've ever held. But again, that money was hard-earned, right? That was money I had to work hard for. You know this too, money that you've worked hard for feels like more for you, even if it's a tiny amount. And so I don't want you to get discouraged about this idea that, man, I'm only accruing money a little bit at a time. When we do that, we understand the value of that money so much greater, right? So I want to ask you a question because the reality is that most of us don't like to accrue money little by little. We want to get like the big bucks, whether it's working overtime or it's running into a huge windfall, it's investing in the stock market, or it's playing the lottery. Just out of curiosity, this is in person only. Online people, you cannot answer this question. How many of you in person have ever played the lottery before? Yeah, all right. So online folks, it's everybody. It's everyone. There was one guy in the back who like did this, but I know he's played the lottery. He's just fooling us. So here's the question for everyone then. If you won the lottery, what would be the first thing you'd purchase? What would be the first thing you would buy or spend your money on if you won the lottery? Go ahead and take a minute, share with somebody around you, online people, I want to see your answers down below. What would you buy if you won the lottery? Okay, I think that's long enough. Perhaps for some of you, it would be a car or a home. Maybe it would be clothes. Maybe some of you would go to a really nice restaurant. If you were me, you would just go to McDonald's and spend it on McDonald's, right? Just junk food, whatever. Perhaps there are some of you who are very altruistic and you were like, you know what I would do? I would give money to the poor or I would bless somebody else with my money. The reality is that none of us are like, if I won the lottery, you know what I would do? I would just put it in a bank. That's not you. <clears throat> <laughs> what you, even if you were going to put it somewhere, you're investing it somewhere. All of us are taking that money and doing something with it. As a matter of fact, all of us are taking that money and like throwing it around a little bit, right? A little bit. You got you to, just a tiny bit, right? We're going to be wise, but just a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there. Yeah, my buddy Levi is like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I get you. I get you. So, so here's where I want to throw a little bit of cold water on this. There's a couple lottery statistics that I want to share with you. We're going to put them up there, but I'm going to explain them. The first one is the odds of winning the lottery are 1 in 175 million. So that means if you play every day and there's, I don't, I don't know how to do the odds. The odds are 1 in 175 million. Let's just say that, that you do not have good odds. I believe I understood correctly that you have better odds of getting struck by lightning than winning the lottery. 
The next one, this is really cool, is really specific to us, New York. Give yourselves a pat on the back for this. Congratulations. New Yorkers spend more money on the lottery than any other state. Yeah, well done. We spend $9 billion, billion with a B, $9 billion every single year. Every single year on the lottery. So good job, New Yorkers. We crushed it. We want money fast the most. And finally, and this is a study done in Florida uh, a few years back, it turns out that 70% of all lottery winners have lost all of that money or have spent all of their lottery winnings within seven years. So within seven years, all of their lottery money is gone for like three quarters of the people who win the lottery. So these should discourage you, right? My sister used to have a bumper sticker that said, lottery is tax for stupid people. I don't want to say mean things about you like that because I saw you all raise your hands. You're not stupid, but the odds are not in your favor. And uh, what could we do with that $9 million, $9 billion every year other than that? I don't know. <clears throat> so all of this is to take us back to some practical money tips. This is how to better use your money. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It just says live within your means. Uh, let's break that down a tiny bit. It means spending less than you make. It seems reasonable, it seems logical, but so many of us spend more than we make. So just spend less money than you make every month. The other one is don't take on extra debt, right? Because it turns out there's this thing called interest and compound interest, and when you take out debt, the, the credit card company, they do this to make money off of you. So, so don't take out debt. Don't take out extra debt, don't take out any debt. As a matter of fact, get rid of all of your debt. And the final one here is to budget, and this maybe is the most important important one. You can't do any of the others if you don't do this one. That is to budget. To actually sit down and look at what you have and what you spend and make sure those two things match in a way that you get to have money at the end of the month or the end of the week. It's really, really simple, but what this does is this allows you, again, to control your money so your money doesn't control you. Lastly, I want to remind you, hard-earned lesson learned. Money that you work hard to earn is money that you're going to value. It's going to be a lesson that you learn about the value of the money. This is really, really important. If you don't remember anything else, you don't remember like live within your means or lottery statistics. You don't remember that Solomon, the wisest person ever, said like, hey guys, more money, more problems. If you don't remember any of that, remember this idea that the money that you work hard for is the money you're going to value, right? Little by little, you're going to grow that. You're going to value that. You're going to control that. And so once again, hard-earned, lesson learned. But that's what I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer. God, sometimes we don't want anyone to tell us what to do with our money. It's ours. It's our money. And yet, Lord, you have this wisdom and this plan for us that says, guys, I want you to have more money. I want your money to do more for you. And ultimately, I want you to be happier. I must remember that it's okay to gain money little by little. It's okay to work hard for our money because then there are lessons that come along with that money. Lord, ultimately help us to remember that, uh, that you love us and you want what's best for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.